La, la, la. Hey. Whoa, Nelly, look at that. Ah, that's a heck of a way to say hello. I don't think we should be uh, making contact like this until we've been formally introduced. Uh, so, uh, yeah, why don't you just give me a little sup down and, and we'll chat a little bit. That's it. Yeah, have we met before? You look familiar. Oh, ow, getting a little fresh, aren't you? Uh, easy there, okay? Yeah, nice and easy, nice and Ooh, quit the shaking. You're kind of throwing me off balance here. Yeah, oh, I've seen you before. You're a great blue heron. I saw you on Birdwise on Channel 22, Thursdays at 8.30 and Sundays at 1. Yes, you... Ooh, not good. This is just a little too up close and personal. I'd rather watch it on TV. Yeah, that's right. I think I'm lunch. Watch watch the feet. Thank you. Ooh. Well, that's birds from an inside perspective. Welcome to BirdWise for October 2007. Tonight we'll have Dr. Bert Gutman telling us about the unique behaviors of acorn woodpeckers. We welcome Scott Pearson to tell us about his research on streaked horn larks. We'll have our regular features, the calendar and feather report. We'll go to the mail, mailbag for a question. And now we'll go to our bird of the month, the brown creeper. The brown creeper, Certhia americana, is a fairly common permanent resident in forests statewide. Actually, it's common all across North America south to Nicaragua. Creepers prefer extensive areas of mature forests, usually coniferous but also deciduous trees. Nests are made of twigs and bark chips bound by spider webs placed behind curls of old bark. The nest is lined with fine bark shreds, moss, plant down, hair or feathers. Five to six white eggs with reddish brown spots are most common. The female incubates the eggs for about two weeks with the male bringing her meals. Both genders bring food for the nestlings who fledge after about two more weeks. The young are dependent on the adults for at least 17 more days. Look for brown creepers at Priest Point Park or any other large stand of trees. Tonight, Dr. Bert Gutman will tell us about unique family ties among the acorn woodpeckers and their use of acorn trees to cache acorns. Hi, I want to continue with the topic that I was talking about last month. I want to tell you about my Aunt Molly. My mother had a sister, my Aunt Molly, who never married. But she lived with us and in some way she helped to raise me and my two brothers. And the question is, by doing this, was my Aunt Molly somehow enhancing the transmission of her parents' genes to the next generation? Well, my answer is yes. And to explain that, I want to tell you about acorn woodpeckers. Acorn woodpeckers are fascinating birds. They're very common in California and in parts of New Mexico and Arizona. And they reach as far north as the Columbia Gorge. And of course, they live on acorns. They inhabit oak woods and they live almost exclusively on acorn mast when they're adults. But they live in groups, and a group of them lives in a cooperative way and engages in cooperative reproduction. A group of acorn woodpeckers will find a dead tree or perhaps a tree that has a large expanse of bark, and they'll dig out little holes in it and they create a granary. And in this granary, they stuff as many acorns as they can into these holes. This creates a store of acorn mast that they can use in bad times, for example, during the winter, or times when the acorns are not being produced. 
And the survival of a group really depends on the health of the granary. If a tree falls or some other disaster happens that destroys the granary, the group generally has to disperse. Now, in the, this group, the entire group is breeding in a cooperative manner. And the group generally consists of a pair of adults with all of their offspring from the past year or two. The rules of reproduction in this group are that as long as the original pair of adults, the male and female, is still alive, none of the other birds can breed. And they can't go somewhere else and start a group of their own because there is no room for them. We call this habitat saturation. And so all of the individuals who are the offspring of this original pair of breeders are forced to not breed themselves, and they cooperate by being helpers at the nest. Now, in this way, they enhance the transmission of their genes, even though they're not reproducing themselves. They enhance the transmission of their genes to the next generation. Because all of these brothers and sisters have samples of the same genes from their parents. Uh, the British biologist J.B.S. Haldane was once asked if he would lay down his life for a brother. And he said, I would lay down my life for two brothers or eight cousins. Now, why would he say a funny thing like that? Well, it's because two brothers have effectively the whole complement of genes from their parents. Or eight cousins have effectively the whole complement of genes from their grandparents. And so the individuals that are not breeding themselves are enhancing the transmission of these genes. And as I said last month, we have to take the view that genes are selfish. The genes create strategies in the organisms that they produce around them that enhance the replication, the reproduction of more of those genes. Now, generally a group will consist of only the original breeding pair and their offspring of the past year or two. The rules, as I said, are that none of the offspring can breed unless one of the originals dies. Now, for example, if a female of that original pair dies, then her place could be taken by her daughters, or it's more likely that some females from another group would move in and continue reproduction with the original male. So in some cases, we know that there's more than one breeding pair that, that is actually producing all of the young. In some of these cases, there's a very interesting thing that happens. Suppose that there are two sisters that are both breeding and are occupying the same nest. They engage in a very strange pattern of behavior called egg tossing. If these two sisters are both getting ready to lay eggs, invariably one of them will lay the eggs before the other. Then the other sister will go into the nest and pick out the egg and take it out and lay it on a branch of a tree and peck it open and all of the members of the group, possibly even including the female who laid it, will eat the contents of the egg. Now this may continue for several days. It'll continue until the other sister lays the first egg. And in that case, they can't tell the difference between the two eggs. And so they will both continue to lay eggs and they'll produce a clutch of eggs. And then they'll both incubate the eggs or they'll incubate the eggs along with the cooperation of some of the helpers in the group. And so eventually a little clutch of birds will be produced and all the members of the group will aid in feeding and protecting these young. By egg tossing, they, the, the sisters manage to more or less equalize their own contribution to the next generation. Well, I hope you're able to go out and see acorn woodpeckers sometime. They're really wonderful birds. They're very clownish and very loud. And when you're looking at acorn woodpeckers, you'll have, I hope, a different perspective 
to look at them with and to understand them. We're fortunate tonight to have Dr. Scott Pearson of the Department of Fish and Wildlife with us. He's been studying streaked horned larks in the Puget Lowlands for the past six years. We'd like to hear his story. Well, horned larks are found throughout uh, the world, and in North America we have 21 subspecies of horned lark. And the subspecies I've been studying is one of those 21 subspecies. We have three subspecies of horned lark breeding in Washington. There's the streaked horned lark, which is found in the Puget Lowlands and on the coast of Washington and on the lower Columbia River. There's the alpine horned lark, which is found up in the alpine habitats. And then there's the third subspecies, which is found in eastern Washington. Now, we I had one initial question I had is, was the street horn arc genetically distinct and evolving independently? And that was one of the first questions we sought to answer. And we found out it, it actually is independent. It, it actually evolved from the California coastal birds and not the other birds, the horn larks that we see here and other subspecies of horn larks we see here in Washington. And it appears to be uh, evolving independently and has been for some time. Uh, it's much smaller than every other subspecies, and it's also much brighter in color than every other subspecies. It has much more yellow and a lot brighter reds on the back. The other two do not have any special legal status. Only the street horn lark does, and it is considered a federal candidate for listing underneath the Endangered Species Act, the federal act, um, which indicates there's enough information to suggest that it could be listed underneath that act. It's listed as endangered in Washington, um, underneath our state's Endangered Species Act. And then in British Columbia, it's actually listed as endangered and also has another listing which means extirpated. It means it's no longer found there. It used mm -hmm. to be, but is no longer there. Historically, it bred in southern British Columbia all the way down to the Rogue River Valley. And over time, that range has contracted both in the north and the south. So now it's only found in southern Puget Sound, not north of here. And then it's only found really from the Eugene Corvallis area north, where it used to be found all the way down to the Rogue River Valley. What types of habitats do the streaked horn larks prefer? Well, they prefer areas that are treeless and shrubless and that are dominated by grasses and forbs and need to be fairly large in size. And so you find it on native uh, Puget prairies. You find it on actually dredge spoil islands. You find it on beaches along the Washington coast. And you also find it on airports which are treeless and shrubless and very large. All of the airports that it is found on used to be Puget Prairies, and um, people put the airports there probably because it was flat and open. So McCord Air Force Base was put on a prairie, Gray Army Airfield was, Shelton Airport was, and so was Olympia Airport. Actually, Olympia Airport used to be known as Bush, Bush's Prairie. One of the primary threats to reproductive success, successful reproduction, is uh, predation. and. We, it's been difficult for us to capture predators in the, in the act of, of eating their eggs or chicks. We have opportunistically watched a couple of different predators. We've seen a garter snake, a garter snake, eating the young on, on prairie. We've seen two crows eating either young or eggs. And then we actually watched northern harrier eat eggs on the coast, um, interestingly. So we, we just happen to capture those. And it's hard to know about the signific significance of those. You know, are those the important predators? Could it be actually a small mammal? And so one thing this year we wanted to know we put, was, well, can we answer that question? Who are the primary predators? So we put out cameras on nests, and then we rotated those cameras around. We actually had three digital cameras, and they take images, uh, digital images, 24 hours a day. So they're taking them at night and also during the day. And then we can look at those images later and try to determine who the predator was if that nest happens to be um, eaten by predators. Well, we had, unfortunately, some, well, fortunately for the lark, but unfortunately for us, very few of the nests where we placed cameras um, had predators. But the few that we did document were actually eaten, the eggs were eaten by western meadowlarks, which was a real surprise. We, we, if you look in the literature, you see that there's evidence that western meadowlarks are predators of other grass and birds, but I hadn't really suspected them. And the, it occurred on the same prairie, but the, the two nests were very far apart, and so they would have been in different meadowlark territories, indicating this probably was two different western meadowlarks that uh, ate the eggs on both of these nests. And then also the pattern of, of depredation, so the pattern of how the event occurred is consistent with what we've seen 
at other nests where one egg will disappear one day or one or two eggs and then several days will pass before another egg will, will be eaten. And that's what we captured on film with the western meadowlarks. They came in, ate an egg, and then waited a few days and then came back and ate another egg. So here's a native species found on the same grasslands that's eating eggs of the horn lark. And that to me was interesting, and, but I also think there's some lessons for management from this. Uh, as, these, as these prairies become vegetated by non-native grasses, they become quite dense. And meadowlarks do very well in that. Also, meadowlarks like small shrubs for perches for singing off of. And so we're losing the sparsely vegetated areas that horn larks prefer, but we seem to be having an increase in the amount of habitat that the western meadowlark prefers. And so if we could create core areas that are very, very sparsely vegetated, I would suspect that meadowlarks wouldn't use those as well, as much as they do now. Uh, that might move them to the periphery. Uh, one question we wanted to figure out is, is fire a good thing for larks? Because all of our Puget Prairies evolved with fire, or actually really human-caused uh, fire. Um, so Native Americans were burning Puget Prairies for probably thousands of years. Over time, as those fires have been suppressed and we've developed the landscape, so we developed lands where they used to be, um, we're now seeing shrubs and trees encroaching. And we're seeing, particularly right now, a lot of non-native plants coming in. And when it becomes dens densely vegetated, uh, the lark won't use it anymore. If you think about a lark, a lark walks on the ground. Some birds hop and some walk. This is a walker. Mm -hmm. and it needs to be able to walk through its environment. And it's walking through its environment to find seeds and insects. And as it becomes denser, uh, it's very hard for the alert to move through that environment. And in general, you just find they move away from those environments. So what would you say is the prognosis for the horned lark in the next 20 years? Well, our, all of our analyses suggest that Lambda is less than one, and what lambda means is that it's a declining, you have to have a lambda of one or greater to have an increasing population. All of our modeling suggests that actually it's decreasing over time. So it looks bad. Uh, we probably have fewer than 800 birds left in the world. So it's probably one of our rare subspecies uh, out there. And so it, it doesn't look good at the moment. And so unless we do something quickly, I don't think it stands a whole lot of chance of surviving in the future. Uh, but I think there are things we can do, and there are things that people are doing to try to change that, and, and hopefully we'll, we will make some efforts to, to turn that tide and, and go in a different direction. Let's go to Sheila McCartan for our calendar in October and to Phil Kelly for the Feather Report. Thanks, Tom. Black Hills Audubon Society has a number of field trips planned for this fall. These field trips are free and open to the public. Field trips are a great way to learn more about our local birds and spend time with people who enjoy watching birds. So on Saturday, October 13th, join a field trip to Capitol Forest. Field trip leaders Jim Prusky and Lonnie Sumner will spend the day in Capitol Forest to see what birds there might be there this time of year. Gray jays and mountain quails are residents, as are many woodland birds. Call the Black Hills Audubon Society office at 352-7299 to register. On Saturday, December 1st, join field trip leader Bert Gutman for Downtown Ducks Part 1. Large numbers and many species of waterfowl winter in the downtown Olympia area. This uh, field trip is primarily for beginners, but anyone can attend. So call the Black Hills Audubon Society office at 352-7299 to register. On Saturday, December 8th, the Black Hills Audubon Society sponsored field trip will go to the Goodrich Pond and Chehalis River Discovery Trail. Join field trip leader Dave Hayden for this all-day trip along the newly opened River Trail. This has become the hot birding spot in Lewis County. Dave hopes to find a variety of waterfowl, possibly some swans, raptors, shorebirds, and any other possible wintering species. Call the Audubon Society office at 352-7299 to register. 
On the weekend of October 13th and 14th, you might want to take a little drive and join the many activities planned for Bird Fest and Bluegrass at Ridgefield National Wildlife Refuge. Some highlights include Sandhill Crane Viewing, guided walks, and tours of the recently completed Chinook and Plank House. For a complete list of all the activities, check out their website at ridgefieldfriends.org. By the way, Ridgefield National Wildlife Refuge also has a number of guided walks scheduled for this fall. Find out about these on their website at fws.gov ridgefield. We'll close our report today with our avian forecast for October with Birdwise Featherman, Phil Kelly. Well, thank you, Sheila. Folks, the feather forecast for the month of October is up and down. And by up and down, I mean this is the month when the wintering waterfowl start to show up in our area. So if you look up, you're going to see some ducks and geese flying in. It's also a good month for raptors, bald eagles, red-tailed hawks, northern harriers. As the farm fields are plowed, they can see their food sources better running along the ground when the high grass and the corn and the hay is gone. So we'll see a lot more of them around the area. By down, I mean this is when the winter sparrows start to show up and flock up. And a lot of those you're going to see on the edges of the grassy fields, on gravel roads, particularly in the morning they'll be down picking up grit that they can use to grind up the seeds they're going to eat that day. We'll have golden crown sparrows, white crown sparrows, song sparrows, fox sparrows will start showing up in the area again. Spotted towhees will continue to be around, including the young of the year, and they are not quite as shy as the adults are. So there's a good chance you can see some of these birds this month. Uh, this is arguably one of the slower months because the the summer songbirds have moved south. The winter birds are just starting to come in. So October is kind of a transition month. But like I said, look for raptors, for red-tailed hawks, bald eagles, northern harriers. Uh, look for the start of the waterfowl coming in and also look for these sparrows. So grab your binoculars, get out there, and go see if you can find these birds. Our question for the night is, what is a feather? Well, birds are the only creatures with feathers. Feathers are basically an outgrowth of the skin, and they're the most complex outgrowth of skin of any animal. Feathers are one of the lightest and strongest substances known to be grown by an animal. Let's look at the, what makes a feather. The basic shape of a feather is known by most people. The central portion is called the shaft. From the shaft, emerge veins. The veins can be pulled apart. It doesn't harm, harm the feather. Each of the veins has on it barbs. Barbs are very fine little hooks that come out from the edge of the vein. Each of the barbs has on it barbules, and from the barbules are barbulettes. These allow the feather to be zipped back together. Birds will do this during preening. When their feathers have become ruffled, they'll be able to use their beaks to zip their feathers back together to form a nice strong structural feature. If you have any questions for Birdwise, please send them to tctvbirdwise at yahoo.com. Thank you for watching the show. We hope you'll come back again. This can be seen eight times a month at least with showings on Thursday night at 8.30 and Sunday afternoons at 1 o'clock, channel 22. Let's go to our Closing passage from William Leon Dawson. His rendition of a brown creeper is one of my favorite Dawson passages. Serthia is a prosy drab, for all the beauty she possesses is in the eyes of her little hubby, dear devoted creature. This clerkling, hubby of course I mean, was brought into the world behind a bit of bark. His first steps, or creeps, were taken along the bark of the home tree. When the little wings got stronger, and when the little claws had carried him up to the top of tree number one, he fluttered and spilled through the air until he pulled up somehow, with heart beating fiercely, at the base and on the bark of tree number two. Since then he has climbed an almost infinity of trees, but I dare say he has kept count. Summers and winters have gone over his head, but never a waking hour in which he has not climbed and tumbled in this worse than Sisyphean task of gleaning nits and eggs and grubs from the never-ending bark. 
But wait, I am not sure. Could anyone live in these majestic forests? Could anyone breathe this incense of perpetual balsam? Could anyone mount triumphantly these aspiring tree boles way, way up into the blue without growing the soul of a poet? Hark! Chew, chewy, chewy, ping, chewy! An angel ditty lisped in the treetops where the tender green fir fronds melt into the sky. Some warbler, I guess, the hermit perhaps, rounding out his unsaid devotions. And again, ki kus wit itty swee, like a garland of song caught up at either end and made fast to the ether. No, would you believe it? It is our prosy clerkling. He has turned fay and goes caroling about his task as blithely as a bejeweled artiste with nothing to do. Love, yes, love of the woods, for it is the middle of September. <laughs>